Good afternoon. I'm Mark Smith. I'm the chair of the Business Advocacy Advocacy, that's hard to say, committee for the Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation today. Thank you for coming. We start, I'd like to start out, as we always do, by recognizing our major sponsor, Prevea. Thank you, Prevea, for sponsoring our efforts today. And thanks, too, to the Elks Club for providing our fine feast again today. Thank you very much. We also like to recognize our elected officials that are in the audience. I saw Mayor Mike Vandersteen. Mayor Mike. <laughs> Senator Lemahieu, thank you both for coming. I'm sure they would both love to talk to you after the presentation today. <laughs> also, if you could, please, business advocacy members, please raise your hands. For as far as the presentation goes today, if you've enjoyed what you've heard, if you'd like to hear more of the same, if you'd like to hear other topics, please see any one of us who raised our hands after the presentation today. The Business Advocacy Committee is the group that actually puts on these presentations every month. So we'd love to hear your ideas, positive, negative, ideas for improvement, whatever you have. We'd love to hear your ideas so that we can improve and keep these presentations going. Before we get started with today's event, uh, we have a special announcement. Please. Yeah, I'm a little shorter than that. <laughs> Not short, just a little shorter than that. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. I just asked for a couple of minutes because I wanted to let all of you know, and especially those in our audience who are in human resources, um, we have a, uh, a wonderful opportunity coming, coming up on August 16th and 17th. It is a someplace better tour for HR folks and for realtors. Um, and this, it, has anybody gone on it? We had our pilot last year. Did anybody attend that? Well, the reviews from that were excellent. And this year, we're going to have a, an evening reception on the 16th. And that's going to be at Spaceport. And you'll have an opportunity to, to um, interact with some of the people representing some of our assets in Sheboygan County. And then the next day is a, is a full day tour. And you're going to learn everything possible that you can put in your toolbox to help sell this county to potential recruits who might be considering moving here. Uh, and it's, it's really put together well. You're going to have a great time. It's also a lot of fun. Um, we've even slipped in a little sales training as a part of it so that you can learn those techniques as well. But um, please, if you want more information on this, you can actually just go to our website. Um, you can email Tammy at Sheboygan.org. Um, or you can, um, hopefully you're getting our Monday monitors, and if you're not, see me, give me your card, and we'll sign you up for that. Um, so, but just a great opportunity. We didn't want you to miss it. If you haven't signed up yet, there's still space, um, so please just uh, make it a priority if you're thinking, and for other people on your staff as well. Um, so thanks. Thanks, Mark. And thank you. Um, one other announcement I'd like to make before we get started with today's discussion is next week's, next month's First Friday Forum will actually not be held on the first Friday because that's going to be the Labor Day weekend. So it will be on the second Friday, that's September 9th. The topic will be cybersecurity, fraud stories, and how to protect yourself. I'll tell you that I've already heard this presentation, and it will scare you, but it will also give you some ideas, some practical ideas you can take to help out yourself and your business. So with no further ado, today's presentation is on the Affordable, Air Ca Affordable Care Act, Navigating the Affordable Air Ca Navigating the Affordable Care Act is the topic for today. Thank you very much. And our panelists will be Andy Bogno. He's from the St. Nicholas Hospital. Terry Lullisand, a shareholder and tax CPA from Schenck. Julie Meyer, an account executive from Hub International, and Kristen Stearns, the executive director of the Lakeshore Community Health Center. If you could please join us up here on the stage. And one other announcement, a little bit of housekeeping for us all while they're coming up on the stage. There are cards on each one of your tables, cards and pens. If you wouldn't mind, please write your questions down on these cards, and we'll get them to our panelists, and they would like to answer your questions at the end of their presentation. Well, thank you.
Hopefully nothing falls. I'm Terry Lillisand and I work at Shank. I'm a, a shareholder in our tax department. So the ACA and the impact that it has on my clients has been a pretty big deal for us the last several years. Well, six years. It's been around for six years. So I just want to talk about a few things um, from a tax perspective in the business world, really kind of focusing on the small employer. Um, large employers, if, you, if there are any that are out there, you have some different issues. You have the whole reporting requirement, the 1095Cs. You have potentially large employer penalties for failing to offer insurance or, or f uh, affordable insurance. But small employers have um, some additional things that I think hit them, probably can potentially hit them pretty hard. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is reimbursement of employee individual policy premiums. It's very common for small companies to not offer health insurance to their employees. Instead, what they do is they say, employee, if you have health insurance, go out and get your own policy and I'll reimburse some of your premiums. That is really common and I'm convinced it is still happening today. The tax world has not changed, but there's an interpretation of the ACA that um, the HHS and um, the IRS took that basically said, if you as the employer reimburse individual premiums for your employees, while that does not create a taxable income situation to your employees, which it never did, you now as the employer are subject to an ACA violation penalty of $100 per day per incident until you stop doing this. And there was some relief that went from 2015, from January through June of 2015, but that relief is no longer there. So employers that are reimbursing individual premiums uh, for your employees, that's a problem. That puts a 100%, $100 penalty per day for each of your employees that you're doing this for. Now, um, one of the things that can be done is to you got to be careful that you don't tie this too much to the reimbursement, but if you just give your employees additional compensation as taxable wage, they then have the ability to go out and buy and pay for their own premiums. It's not going to be tax-free to them because it can't be because you can't reimburse their premiums because you got this 100%, $100 penalty. But if you do it as additional comp, now they can afford their premium. So it's an unfortunate um, situation right now. There are bills in Congress that would allow small employers to reimburse their employees for premiums and not be subject to the $100 per day penalty. So we'll have to monitor that. Um, but that is a really unfortunate thing that a lot of our, our smaller um, businesses are, are seeing. Um, another, another thing for the small business is the shop exchange. So one of, the, one of the options for offering group insurance is to go to the shop exchange. I don't even remember what it stands for. It's, I can't, there's, that's an acronym. I can't remember what it stands for. But really what the shop exchange is, it's no different than the individual exchange or marketplace that individuals can go to on healthcare.gov to purchase their health insurance. But the shop exchange is for small employers, and it really allows them to pr provide group insurance to their employees. And it's, it's actually... I'm not going to get into the merits or pluses and minuses of the insurance that's offered there, but it does administratively make it very easy for small employers because the shop exchange has, do you have any idea how many, I don't know how many options there are, there's probably what, 40 different options, who knows what the number is, but you as the employer do not have to determine um, what plan or what what's the, the benefits are, the, the individual employees go on to the shop exchange and they pick their own policy. And you can pay for the employer pays for a portion of it, the employee would pay for a portion of it, just like group insurance. And just administratively, the shop just offers you the insurance. It's kind of, it, it would be an easy way. The advantage of doing that is, is there can, there is a credit, a tax credit for small employers who do pay for some of their employees' health insurance for offering the shop exchange group insurance. Um, tax exempt organizations qualify, as do for profit organizations. Um, you have to have a small number of employees under. 25 and wages I think have to be under $50,000 on average and owners don't count in that. So for some people the shop exchange may be a way to offer insurance on a relatively easy basis and also provide a tax credit. Um, one of the things, in, and some of you probably are so clearly a small employer for purposes of the tax things with the ACA, but you always want to be aware of what the definition of small is. Julie is going to talk about what a small group is for her health insurance purposes, which is a different measurement than what a small or large employer is for the ACA. The IRS has very strict rules as to how you determine whether or not you're a small employer or large employer for purposes of whether or not you have a penalty 
Um, so if you are getting borderline and you're looking at, you're, you're creeping up with the number of employees, to me I always look at how many W-2s did an, employee, an employer do? That doesn't necessarily give you the answer whether or not you're small or large, but if you only issued 20 W-2s, no way can you be large for purposes of the ACA and the employer penalty. But if you, if you did 60 of them, you might want to start looking at that. So just be aware that um, that's done on an annual basis. You have to look at 2015 to determine whether or not you're large for 2016. Um, have any of you as the employer received a letter from HHS telling you that you have employees that have enrolled in insurance on the exchange and qualified for subsidy? Okay, so several of you. And some of those, they still be, could be coming out. <clears throat> so what HHS is doing, which is where we go to in the state of Wisconsin for the exchange, HHS is sending out letters to employers that are alerting them to the fact that they have employees that are on the exchange that qualified for subsidy. And the letter is written in such a way that it actually says you as the employer can appeal this subsidy. Okay, it's not your subsidy you're appealing, it's your employee's subsidy that you're appealing. And that makes me almost a little bit nervous because it's not your subsidy. And that kind of puts you as the police for your employee and what they're doing on their individual return and what they're doing in their individual life. There is no penalty for you as the employer to not respond to them. And I've, we've had a lot of debates within our firm, and I've had other people that I've talked to about this, and I've read a lot, and I've talked to some attorneys, and I've actually come to the conclusion that it may not be something that you want to do is to appeal it as the employer. A lot of the reasons that people give to appeal it is, is that they say, well, HHS will notify the IRS. Now, this would be if you're a large employer. They'll notify the IRS to let you know that this person should not have had a subsidy, and hopefully you won't have a penalty situation for that as a large employer. We don't know what the process is going to be. We don't know that HHS will notify the IRS. We don't know that the IRS will look at the information if HHS says this. I'm of the opinion that... Um, I don't know, it's, take, it's going to take time and effort to appeal, and again, it's not your subsidy. You're not fighting for your subsidy, you're actually providing information to take away your employee's subsidy, potentially, or confirm that, there's, that there should be one. The other problem with that appeal is, is that the subsidy is based on their household income, and that is a number as an employer you do not know. So I think that they're really just asking for information and they've worded it to be such that it's an appeal because that makes it a little bit more scary for the employer, oh, I better appeal this or I have to do something. But really, they're asking for information for, from you, which at this point you're not obligated to provide. So, um, you know, that will be a decision everybody has to make. But I think if you are going to appeal them, you need to appeal them uniformly so that your employees can say, hey, why did you appeal his and not mine, or vice versa? Because again, I think it's a little bit of adversarial thing that's going on here with that appeal. <clears throat> okay, the other thing I just want to talk about, I just want to remind people, and Kristen will talk about this a little bit too, is for those of you, those of you who, who are on the exchange or those of you who have employees, they are, there are subsidies that are eligible if their income is between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level. And for a family of four in 2016, that 400 percent is about $95,000. So a lot of people are really eligible for a subsidy in the state of Wisconsin just based on our standard of living in our cost of living and our wages here. Um, the only people that do qualify for a subsidy, though, are those that don't have any insurance offered to them at all, or if the employer provided insurance is unaffordable. If someone does actually receive a subsidy, though, they have to go through a, a process on their tax return by filling out a form to make sure that they're eligible for the subsidy. And if they're not, but they had an advanced subsidy that was uh, issued to them each month, they have to pay that back. One of the arguments I heard going back to this exchange notification is one of the arguments to do this, to appeal it is, you may be watching out for the best interest of your employee if they're not really eligible for subsidy and will have to pay it back. If we can get that subsidy stopped sooner than later, maybe that's in the employee's best interest. But I don't know if we really know that or not. So, um, but the subsidies are very nice. They're very lucrative. It's based on um, adjusted gross income of people's tax returns, and um, so there can be some planning that can be done. That if your income is just a little bit too high, something might be done, and you might be able to get a nice subsidy out of that. So, 
Uh, that's, I think, all I have from kind of a business uh, CPA tax perspective for small employers. Thank you, Terry. And I'm Julie Meyer from Hub International. I'm an account executive and I work in the employee benefits um, area. So since 2010, have been working uh, with my clients around the Affordable Care Act. Um, we do not give tax advice. Um, we take a more strategic approach, um, working with our clients to uh, plan for the next three to five years. And um, I've been asked to give, again, a small employer uh, perspective on um, offerings for health insurance, and I'll probably deviate a little bit to larger employers towards the end of my um, conversation. But um, like Terry said, uh, there are a lot of small employers who do not offer health insurance. And, and the reason they don't offer it is because um, it's expensive. Um, there is some potential for getting tax credits. I find in my practice um, that a lot of um, employers simply aren't eligible for the tax credit or, as Terry mentioned, their family-owned businesses. Um, so they themselves do not qualify for, for the credit. Um, one of the reasons I am finding, though, that more small employers are offering coverage because they're not required to um, under the Affordable Care Act. They're not subject to the penalty if they have less than 50 employees. But I'm finding some companies are starting to offer health insurance where they hadn't before uh, because of the whole idea of uh, attracting and retaining employees. That's a um, very important um, part of hiring. And we were talking earlier in our conversation, you know, when I got my first job, I didn't know anything about the health insurance because it didn't cost anything and I had a hundred dollar deductible. Um, I have kids now that are under 25 years old and um, the they're very aware um, because once they come off of our policy where they have free insurance, when they turn 26, they'll have to pay for their own insurance. Um, that job and how that job pays is going to be um, very much affected by the cost of their health insurance, a couple hundred dollars a month taken off their uh, paycheck or more, uh, plus they'll have these substantial deductibles. So from a, an attract and retain perspective, I mean, they're looking for positions where they'll have um, health insurance offered or available to them. Um, qualifying for a subsidy and buying coverage on the exchange, of course, is also an option. And that really was a goal of the Affordable Care Act to get more people covered. Um, but um, that, that will also be an option to them. But what's more appealing is having an employer that offers uh, health insurance. So we're finding more small employers actually inquiring at least or asking about offering health insurance than they did in the past. I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of community rating. And like Terry mentioned earlier, uh, penalties for employees with 50 or more employees, um, the, the way that the count happens is different than um, 50 or more employees for community rating. So what community rating is, is that everybody pays the same rate, every group pays the same rate regardless of health conditions. So if, you're, if you were an older and or unhealthy group, you probably move to a community rated policy. And those policies can be purchased on or off the exchange. So um, those were the groups that moved to these community rated policies. The younger, healthier groups are still in transitional relief. And this is under 50 employees. They're still staying where they're at. And that transitional relief actually has been delayed, I think, three times, um, ends on January 1, 2018, um, as um, things are currently written. So what you can imagine is that, you know, these younger, healthier groups who had transitional relief, the old, like, your old plan, you can keep your old plan, um, they're still paying, I mean, they're not getting you know, substantial price increases, but these plans that move to community-rated plans, um, they're they tend to be somewhat unhealthy and a little bit older, and, and they are getting some significant price increases, as are the individual products, which I think um, Christine will be talking about later. This transitional relief and, com and community rating and how we count for community rating is 50 or more employees' average count on your payroll. So you could have six full-time employees and 60 part-time employees and still be community rated. Like a landscaper, a big landscaper might be an example where um, they have, you know, 60 people on their payroll, only six full-time employees. Well, they could get themselves out of community rating because 
they have more than 50 employees on their payroll average. And again, that can be favorable for some companies. You know, if they're young and healthy, they get themselves out of community rating, that can be favorable. It cannot be favorable if they're older or unhealthy because, again, those community rates are very, very high. Um, so just something to think about. It'll be interesting to see what happens when um, the community rating applies to um, everyone, um, what happens with, with those rates. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on with small employers is some carriers are offering what they call a level funded product. Um, basically it's a hybrid self-funded product. So what you're doing is you're buying a stop loss deductible, a high deductible on each of your individuals in the plan and then hiring an insurance company to administer those claims. Um, there's a maximum exposure that's set, that's set on those plans but it's self-funded, so community rating doesn't apply to those plans. So again, um, if you're a younger, healthier group, um, you might want to consider self-funding. Um, I had one group that was community rated. I still can't figure out for the life of me why I, I had taken them over there, a small contractor. And they uh, went to self-funding and were able to, you know, even on their maximum exposure, save sig significant amounts of money. So that's something to take a look at, but take a look at carefully because if you need to exit that self-funded plan, you need to have a plan that gives you a good way, a good way to exit that plan. And most of the carriers that are offering these um, smaller self-funded plans um, do have provisions in the policy um, for doing that. So that, that's one um, strategy. Um, something that larger companies are doing to uh, reduce their costs, and again, 50 or more, they're rated based on their experience. So a, a healthier 50 year older group is going to get more competitive rates than an unhealthy 50 year over. Um, I'm finding that the carriers have been competitive with these 50 plus groups because they can still underwrite. They're looking at them very closely. When we're looking at a three to five year plan, we don't like to you know, put our employees in a situation where they have to get a different insurance company every year so you know we're putting plans out to bid but we really don't want to have people always having to change their insurance carriers change their cards change their providers so just as a side note with my larger employers um, and hub international happens to have a separate data analytics department um, where they'll take a look at the carriers rate offers prior claims experience demographics and you know say yes that was a good rate or or no it's not Unfortunately, we're still working situations so where we have to do RFPs almost annually um, you know, to work with the carriers to get the best uh, possible available rates. The danger in doing that, though, is then the bad year comes and then you get this huge rate increase and then you have to communicate to that to your employees as well. And that's another thing that I wanted to touch on is plan communication. Um, these benefits, again, are very, very important to your employees. Um, so how those benefits are communicated is also very important. Um, Christine mentioned at lunch, you know, do people understand that they have preventative coverage on their plan, that preventative coverage is there, is covered at 100%. Um, do they really even, you know, know actually what their benefits are? Um, do they understand that if you're not offering health insurance um, that they can't just get health insurance whenever they want? They have to wait for the open enrollment. All those things I think are important to communicate to your employees. And the other thing I like to talk about is, you know, it doesn't probably matter so much with community rating, but it really does for all of us as a whole, is that claims costs are really what drives premiums. I mean, there's, when there's higher claims, the premiums get higher. That's for all of us on a community rated plan or um, on, a, um, on an individually rated group plan. So wellness is really the key, I think, for at least leveling out um, the increase in plan costs um, going forward. Uh, for larger groups, you know, they can chase net networks, try to get the best networks from the providers. Um, there's all sorts of things that uh, larger employers can do, but I think the really where it's at in um, messaging is, is doing everything that you can to keep your employees healthy. And again, that goes back to uh, communications. Um, with the large groups, many offer um, on-site, near-site clinics, uh, health reimbursement arrangements. Um, wellness programs, but the carriers too, the insured carriers, check with your carrier to see what wellness offerings they have. Many of them have wellness programs built into their, their insurance plans that your employees can access. So again, um, to conclude really, I think it's uh, communication to your employees. Um, what are you communicating? How are you, how, 
how are you communicating, um, and how is your health insurance and benefits plan utilized to work with your um, hiring and attracting and retaining employees uh, process. Hello, my name is Andy Bagnall and I serve as the President and CEO of St. Nicholas Hospital. And I want to go at this a little different, um, more from the provider um, hospital perspective of the ACA and how that's impacted us and how we look different today than where we were at five, ten, two, three years ago. Um, I would say in the healthcare industry we're going through perhaps the most rapid pace of change that we've ever seen. Um, so there's a lot of complexity to what you've already heard today and what you will hear from uh, myself um, as well. Going back several years, there was really three things that the Affordable Care Act uh, sought out to address. Uh, number one, cost. The trajectory that we were on um, as a country was uh, unattainable in terms of the cost structure for Medicare and the cost of health care services. Number two, to address quality. Um, back in uh, 1999, I believe, um, there was a report that came out um, that uh, we were um, one of the highest leading causes of death um, in the United States. Hospitals uh, were, providers were. That's not a good thing. Um, so um, we needed to do something to improve quality across this country. And number three, to address the coverage uh, issue, the lack of um, the uninsured uh, population. So those are the three basic um, premises uh, around the Affordable Care Act. I just want to make sure we're all grounded in that. The other piece, and I, and I think right now, we're, we are, um, we're correcting or we're, we are healing a fractured health care system in this country, essentially. And um, there were issues and um, things that this really sought out to address. Number one, a siloed and misaligned payment system or mechanism, how we pay for health care services. Number two, the lack of health care care coordination and transition management. So coordination between providers, hospitals, uh, post-acute care providers, et cetera. Number three, addressing the growing uninsured population um, and rein reinforced by risk selection. Number, uh, number four, um, there are uneven outcomes across the country. Some are doing it really well, some not so well. And how do we even that out and improve that? And then finally, you know, the, as I mentioned before, um, unsustainable cost increases without um, improvement in out outcomes. So really three major goals, as I mentioned, coverage, payment, financing, um, and, you know, from a hospital's perspective, you know, where, where we stand today and where we're headed, um, we're really moving, um, we've had a foot and two canoes, so to speak, um, from a provider's perspective for many years, um, and, and, and the, the, the foot in the canoe is really transitioning over more towards value from volume. Um, as a provider, you know, when I say we're a provider, um, we are no longer just a hospital taking care of patients coming into, you know, St. Nicholas Hospital. Um, we are also a physician uh, group. Um, we have Prevea as part of our group, and I know Aurora in town has a medical group as well. But we're also an insurer now. And so it's really, we go at this as, a, we're really a three-legged stool, um, is what we say, um, in coordinating care the best way we can for the population that we serve to provide value. So um, when we look at um, our risk for payment, we're, we're looking at about a quarter or more of our payment, um, and, and really it's our opera operational mar operations margin, um, is now um, at risk um, for, um, uh, whether that be through the insurance side that we're taking on risk or value-based purchasing from the federal government. And so <clears throat> each year um, we are getting paid more and more to take on more risk. So um, for better outcomes, better payment. Um, not good outcomes, no payment, or even actually a reduction in payment. And so I'm going to walk through some of those things that, that, um, that, that are addressed by that, but also the implications um, on this mar on market reform or the Affordable Care Act. The first one, uh, and, I, and I think um, 
is a real important one is, is, is a hospital um, is, is really partnering with your medical staff and your physicians and making sure that we can coordinate care the best way we possibly can. Um, this really, as I mentioned before, really kind of segues our volume to value equation and looking at how we can better work, um, coordinate care closer with our medical staff providers and make sure that we're going at the care process as one care team. Um, no longer providing care as a pilot um, and so, uh, or care in a silo. And this really addresses um, uh, the triple aim which is better care for patients, uh, better health for populations and lower costs. So when we look at this, um, at least for, for our uh, hospital and our hospital system, um, it, we, we look at it as a care integration strategy. So, so really there's, there's four, um, four layers that we looked at. Number one is the physician slash provider alignment. Um, making sure that we are engaging our medical staff um, in a plan jointly, as I mentioned before, and also establishing a clinical integrated uh, delivery network. Um, so we're working hand in hand with our providers to make sure we're improving quality and cost. And, and also, um, number two, uh, performance alignment um, with our physician partners. So making sure that we have a common approach relative to quality, efficiency, and care management. Um, so making sure that those processes are, are clinically integrated. Number three, ensuring that we have a strategy for payment reform. Obviously, we are well on our way for payment reform. We're, we're in the middle of that right now. But making sure that we are aligning in a way with our uh, payer, um, payers uh, as well to, w w things are looking so much different today than, than where they were from the perspective of you, you, you come to a provider or a hospital, you might have a deductible or copay um, to meet, and, and we just get paid for you know, the volume um, and volume only. Well, today we're entering into unique payment relationships such as bundled payment um, <laughs> systems. So um, if you look at getting a hip or knee replacement, um, it's an episode of care that we're getting paid for today. So we're not just looking at, okay, you come to the hospital, we get paid this, and the physician gets paid this, and then the skilled nursing gets paid this. We're entering into pilots now where we're looking at the whole episode of care. So um, several days prior to admission, your whole admission process, as well as 30 days post-acute, um, getting paid one payment for that entire episode. Um, so much different um, than what we had before. Now that's on one extreme. The others are va of quality measures, so um, patient experience, um, our quality outcomes. Uh, so an example of this is a uh, patient gets readmitted to the hospital, no longer will we get paid for that readmission for certain categories, diagnosis. Um, you have low patient experience ex uh, scores or low um, satisfaction with the care being provided. Um, a portion of that payment will be is at risk um, now. So a lot of different things. And then finally, taking on that financial risk, which is what we're saying, the value-based, you know, we're taking on 100% risk now, being the fact that we're, all, we're now an insurance uh, product. You know, we, Prevea 360 happens to be our insurance plan that we own. Um, it is a narrow network product, and, and the reason why that's narrow, um, and for those of you that don't understand what that, that means, narrow, it's really a coordinated network of limited um, provider panels. So um, it's our system of care. We can guarantee our cost and our quality structure, um, but it's really limited to our providers and our hospitals. So basically, um, probably the best way to, to put this is that um, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We can control our costs. We can control our quality. We can control what we do from an outcome perspective as an insurer in partnership with the hospitals, the physicians, and then we're taking full risk for that. So um, that's population health, um, you know, obviously, you know, to, to the other extreme in terms of um, wh wh where we're headed with this from a provider perspective. Now, one of the things that um, isn't, isn't talked about much, and I know the, the community rating was talked a little bit about um, from, from, from Julie, and this doesn't really have an impact on community rating, but it is very similar to that from a healthcare provider perspective, whereby we're also measured by um, efficiency. Um, how efficient are you? As I mentioned before, um, the bundled payment system, we're, you know, in some cases, we're now being paid as bundled. 
so you're responsible for the whole, whole episode of care. But Medicare is now looking at the uh, Medicare beneficiary spending um, per beneficiary um, and the amount that is being um, outlaid for that um, for each community, hospital, et cetera. And so what, what they're looking at is Medicare claim data to look at the whole episode of care, not just at the hospital, but they're basically saying, you know, hospital, you're, you're now responsible for that whole care episode. So, you know, that's different for us, obviously, as we look at we're not in the skilled nursing business. Now, we, we do have home health care um, services, which is, which is post-acute and, and other related services, but it's really um, forcing us, in, and this is a good thing, um, to partner with our area skilled nursing facilities to ensure that we're preventing unnecessary readmissions, um, preventing other things to come back in the hospital and reducing, reducing costs. So there's a lot of um, partnership and relationships that are happening, even though on the sign of some of these buildings they may not say Aurora or St. Nick's or whatever, um, there's a lot of care coordination that's happening behind the scenes, especially with the post-acute care providers. And, and we're getting measured, it's, it's, on a, it's basically a one-point scale, um, and the federal government is hold, withholding some payment to hospitals now saying, um, you know, you need to be at a certain rate. Um, so it's like, I think it's 0.95, um, and I think the state average is 0.94 last I checked, um, you know, in terms of a cost structure of that entire episode of care. And if you're over that, they're saying, you know, we're going to withhold dollars. Um, now, if you're below that, we're going to reward you, provider, in that, and we might actually even pay you more. So, um, some different things happening there. But as you can, you can see, a lot of coordination has to happen behind the scenes to make that happen. And the best way to describe that in coordinating care is to make sure you have clinically integrated information systems to make that happen. So, um, both uh, Prevea and St. Nick's, we've invested in Epic as our clinically integrated solution for that. Um, and then Aurora did um, almost at the same time as us, which is really very helpful. Um, and so both hospitals in, in Sheboygan now have, you know, grant each other access to care, what we call care everywhere. So if someone goes to one hospital or the other, now we can access medical records to ensure that that care is being coordinated across the system, e even though we're not part of the same system. Um, it might be, you know, even with the skilled nursing facilities, we provide them access to a certain level of data so that we can coordinate that care back and forth. Five, six years ago, guys, that was not happening at all. We weren't talking to one another in that way. So the care coordination has really drastically improved. So I would say from an Affordable Care Act perspective, um, it's accomplished some things <laughs> in, this, in, in, in this community and across the country. The, I'm just going to throw another loop in this presentation here because this is relatively new information. I mean, not, not to the panelists likely, but um, the, the physician payment uh, mechanism has also been in question and up in the air for, for quite some time. Um, the federal government um, really kind of kicked the can down the road for many, many years relative to Medicare payment cuts for, physician, uh, for physicians. And what ended up happening is over the years that, uh, that deficit kept increasing. Um, every year to the point where, it, you know, if they, would, if they would have reduced the payments to physicians, we would have had a pretty catastrophic issue on our hands um, with respect to access and providers. Um, so that was called the sustainable growth rate formula um, that the government came up with a fix uh, this, past, uh, this past year. And it basically creates, um, uh, and, and, and basically what it's called, what they came up as a fix, is it called the Medicare Access and CHIP Re Reauthorization Act of 2015. An acronym within an acronym because it's called MACRA. So um, it, it, again, very complex, um, but I will just, just share with you some of the things that are occurring with that. It essentially creates incentives to move physician payment um, to risk-based models, much like I shared with you on the hospital side, um, payment for value, quality, experience, efficiency, those kinds of things. And so there's, def there's, there's uh, essentially a couple different tracks that are coming down the line for physicians. Number one is called MIPS. 
um, and MIPS stands for Merit-Based Incentive Payment Program. The second is APM, which is Alternative Payment Models. And um, CMS, which makes this more complicated, um, CMS is still uh, writing the regulations, so details emerge every day. Um, but it but essentially applies to all Medicare Part B uh, provider payments, and it really locks in Part B reimbursement rates um, at uh, near zero growth rate uh, annually or less. Um, so what they're doing is are basically um, physicians will um, need to be in one of those alternative payment delivery models or both, um, but I think it's 2019, and so a significant portion of physician payment um, is also going to be at risk um, in the near future and already is beginning to. Um, I will skip some of this uh, because I know it was mentioned earlier, but um, you know this whole acceleration from volume to value, um, how we got there is really a, it's, it's a fundamental shift. Um, from, uh, on a, from a risk perspective from the employers, consumers, health plans, and government payers to providers, medical groups, hospitals, et cetera. I talked a little bit about population management from the perspective that we are now taking on ri full risk um, as an insurer as well, um, but that we're managing the health of the population, um, not just as a, from an insurer perspective, but also provider. We can see the actual claims and, and coordinate that care appropriately. Talked about bun bundled payments, so that really addresses um, some of the care coordination that's necessary um, from, from where we're going. From a cost structure, um, a number of things, um, and I can probably speak on this for about three hours, although I will make it 30 seconds. Um, I will just say that from a healthcare provider perspective, we have really had to become uh, much more lean and efficient in our operations. Um, HSHS stands for Hospital Sisters Health System. Um, we have a 14 hospital system across Illinois and Wisconsin. And I, about six, seven years ago, we really operated more as a holding company for 14 separate hospitals, actually 13 at the time. Um, now we're operating as a health system, leveraging the resources and the relationships and the contractual contracts, et cetera, operating as one system of care in a coordinated way. Um, again, that, that's what you're seeing in some of the alignment structures that are taking place. Uh, many independent hospitals um, are joining health systems, so you're seeing a lot of that consolidation occurring as well across the country. <coughs> And before I pass the microphone, because I'm sure I'm well over my time right now, um, is just some considerations. I, I uh, was on vacation last week, so I was doing a little makeup reading in my office this morning, and I opened the, the Milwaukee Business Journal um, from last week. How many of you read that last week? It's okay if you didn't, because um, I, I, I will point it to you, and if you haven't, um, I would encourage you to go um, online or, or if you still have in your office, take a look and read it, because I think it has some really good points. Um, in there, there was about a two or three page article um, for employers as considerations um, in navigating the Affordable Care Act. How timely? I read it this morning at about 9 o'clock. So I just want to highlight the five points that they made. Um, number one, explore plan design and find options. There's a lot out there, um, and depending on where you're at, and I know it was discussed earlier, there's a lot of implications for each of those, but there's also things that you can do to reduce your spend and reduce your cost. Number two, consider on-site and also near-site clinic solutions and partner with healthcare providers to help coordinate, improve, prevent um, hospitalization, et cetera. Um, number three, anticipate change in how providers are paid. Uh, our world is already different, but anticipate it. Number three, um, welcome market disruption. And we're seeing it around us. Um, health systems are consolidating with other health systems. Um, clinically integrated uh, health networks are forming. Um, a lot of things are happening in, in healthcare. Number five, um, there's a continual and will be a continual downward pressure um, and impact of government um, reimbursement, payment systems, et cetera. So with that, I will pass the mic to Kristen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kristen Stearns, and I just want to ask Jane, how much time do I truly have? It's 1 o'clock right now. Um, we have, like, five Perfect. Okay, I just want to make sure I get everybody out of here. 
I respect your time. Um, so I, I run Lakeshore Community Health Center. For those of you that don't know, we are a federally qualified health care center uh, in Sheboygan and Manitowoc counties. We uh, became uh, a federally qualified health center in June of 2012. So many of you may not know us. Um, we really are here as a safety net provider um, to provide a system of care. We work uh, with our partner agencies, uh, St. Nick, Prevea, and Aurora, um, to provide care, and especially to those that are uninsured and underinsured. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how, uh, how the ACA affects us, as well as uh, to give you, I'm a stats person, and I've got the stats on where our state is today. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, what we, where we've been and, and how, how far we've actually come in ensuring our, our population here in Wisconsin. Um, so just so you know, um, as of February 22nd, which is really the end of open enrollment for the ACA marketplace, uh, there were over 200,000 uh, consumers that were either either selected or were re-enrolled automatically in with the state of Wisconsin. So we have 200,000 people who are who are now uh, receiving AC insurance, which is really exciting. Uh, nationwide, it's about 11.7 million. So if you think about how how we play into that, um, with that. 89% uh, of, of our Wisconsin consumers uh, have been signed up, have qualified for an average tax credit of $315 per month on the marketplace. So those are those subsidies that uh, I think Terry and Julie were talking about. 50% uh, of, of our Wisconsin marketplace enrollees uh, were able to get covered for $100 or less. So their payment in was $100 or less. And there's plans. So if you've never gone on healthcare.gov, I suggest you do, especially if you're a small employer and you're trying to figure out what's going on and what your employees are talking about. Uh, there's different types of plans of bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. They all have different values and uh, have different... Uh, subsidies that go with them, different costs, and um, different deductibles. So, so there's a lot to choose from. Uh, Wisconsin, um, out of those uh, 200,000 uh, consumers that are on ACA, uh, I just want to let you know that 26% uh, of them are between the age of 18 and 34 years of age. So we're covering a large group of that young population uh, that, that in the past uh, may not have been covered. So it, it's really interesting. Um, in the, there was a Gallup survey that recently went out that said the uninsured rate in Wisconsin in uh, 2014 was 8.4%. That's down from 11.7% in 2013. So we're definitely making an impact on getting people insured, which helps all of us. Um, I am sure Andy would say that we would rather have people insured than, than uninsured. It, uh, even with high deductibles, it's cheaper for us overall uh, as, as health, health uh, systems to, to really have those, those insured individuals. Um, uh, we can do a lot more with them, and there's a there's a lot that that is able to be covered. Um, and I think Julie talked about that. There's a lot that's able to be colored, covered. So those HR, you HR people out there, talk about it. Talk about because they everyone is covered the same way, especially with preventative visits. There is no cost to your employers or to anybody who's insured on services such as blood pressure checks, diabetes, and cholesterol tests. Uh, many cancer screenings are included in our insurance, so colonoscopies and mammograms, that's covered at 100%. No copay, no cost. Again, when we talk about making sure that wellness, we're pushing wellness, um, having these preventative services done early on helps overall costs to, to the healthcare systems. Um, counseling, uh, smoking cessation counseling, right? Uh, we want people to quit smoking, that's really important. Losing weight, eating healthy, treating depression, and uh, reduction of alcohol, these are all services that potentially are covered at 100% through, through uh, all of our health care providers. So again, we need to, to educate our, our employees on what is, what is covered. Um, 
regular while well, baby visits, um, you know, different things like that, vaccines, a lot of the vaccines are covered at 100%. So know, know what's covered. Um, it's really, really important to tell your employees that. We, we talk about it all the time. We get a lot of individuals who have never been insured before come into our clinic. They have no idea how to actually use their insurance card what it is, how to understand it, and what's really covered and not covered uh, as a cost. So just make sure that you're doing that. This year, um, hot off the press, I will say, like two days ago, um, we got to see what uh, the increased rate on our ACA marketplace plans were going to be. So for those of individuals who uh, you're working with who are uh, taking ACA plans that are not subsidized, they're looking at a 12 to 36 percent increase in uh, in the cost of care. Now, if they get the subsidies, that's taken on by the subsidies, but overall, if you don't have the subsidy, that's what they're looking at. Um, so those that are over that 400 percent of the FPL uh, that are that are doing that, that's who's going to get hit. So everybody uh, realizes that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what services we provide and how we can assist you. So we have a on-site uh, outreach and enrollment specialist. She's a certified application counselor. Uh, we are the only people in the community, I believe, at this point in time that has that that's available to anyone. Um, so anybody off the street can come in, meet with our certified application counselor, Jennifer Schmidt, uh, go through the marketplace, get assistance, um, and then usually we hand them off to uh, Julie's cohort, uh, Barb, <laughs> if, they, if they really want to dig deep into, into the insurance piece. But we also enroll people in Badger Care, which is the other part of, uh, of the ACA, is that any, any single childless adult now who is under, at or below 100% of the federal poverty level can be insured um, through state Medicaid or Badger Care. Uh, in, and so this includes SSI, SSI-related uh, things, um, MAP, which is, I'm going to get this wrong, uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it has to do with high intense uh, stuff, uh, elderly and disabled co coverage, uh, well women, uh, if some child, if any parent, if anybody becomes pregnant, uh, Medicaid can kick in again. And so that's up to 100% of the federal poverty level. And just so you know where our numbers are, uh, in 2013, uh, about 4,444 individuals were covered. Um, in 2015, at, at year end, it was 51,000. So we're not seeing a huge increase, but again, uh, it is almost 1,000 people that are now covered. Um, and that changes every day. People go on and off Badger Care based on their on their uh, income. Um, so again, uh, we're available. Uh, Jenny's available to come out. I said, we were talking, I said, you know, if you need posters about uh, open enrollment, like it's open enrollment time on the ACA, uh, we've got some of those. Uh, open enrollment this year is November 1st through January 31st. So just like your open enrollment, if you're a big employer, or you understand, there's only a small limited time frame for you to get enrolled. So talk to your employees about it, uh, anyone who's uninsured. Let them know this is the time to get, to get enrolled. You need to be enrolled by December 15th to have coverage on January 1st. So that's a good thing to, to know. Um, and I'll, I'll be done. I'm almost 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, so do you want me to read them to you? You guys want to pick who wants them? Sure. Um, so this is ideas on communication overload about wellness. What if employee numbers change on a regular basis? Maybe you can do that, Terry. Okay. Okay, you can do that one. All right. 
Okay, I just gave Terry the what if your employee numbers change on a regular basis. I'll let her answer the pay or play penalty count. I'll answer community rating. Community rating, basically all you're doing is totaling the number of your employees on your last four quarterly wage and taxes and dividing by four, and that's your total number of employees for determining whether or not you're community rated. And generally, um, the carriers will do it uh, prior to your renewal. They'll a they'll ask you, so that's how they that's how they count. It's pretty simple. Your last four quarters total divided by four. Doesn't matter if they're full time, part time, whatever. They're on your payroll. They count to determine whether or not you're community rated. Yeah. So what Julia just talked about was for the insurance and whether you're a small group or a large group. For purposes of the ACA and whether you're a large employer or a small employer, for determining whether or not you have a 1095C filing requirement, or if you have potentially the employer penalty, that's very very strict rules as to how this is computed. So for 2016, you determine whether or not you're large by looking at 2015 calendar year. It doesn't matter what your health plan year is; it's all calendar year basis, and you look month by month and each month so in January you look to see how many employees do I have in the month of January that worked more than 100, 130 hours or more and they're one person if they work 200 hours they're still one person you don't get to ever be more than one point you're always one full-time equivalent you're never more than one you then you look at all of your people that worked under 130 hours divide by 120 long story and that's your full-time equivalency add those together that's your number of full-time equivalents for January you do that each month and then you look at it for all of 15, take the average of each month. That's how you determine it. It's very, very strict rules. There's no deviation from that and if you're at 49.9, you are under 50. So, but yes, it's always a look back to the prior year to determine. So for 17, you would use 2016 every calendar month and that determines whether or not you're large for 17. Now it probably makes sense why I had Terry answer that question. I don't <laughs> want to answer it. Um, we also have calculators in our office, as I'm sure does Shank does too, if you're on the edge, um, that you can use to help make that calculation hopefully a little bit easier. Yeah, and most payroll software will do it too. Uh, the question I had is an, an ideas on communications overload, how to avoid so people get engaged in wellness. And getting people engaged in wellness, that's a really big, huge question that um, I'm sure um, there's a lot of different answers to. But, you know, the bottom line is that it does work. Um, I have one employer who actually has, um, and, 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 new, and, and other people do too, they have, you know, dietitians that come in and talk. They have, um, you know, people who do um, exercise programs come in and talk and, and it, sometimes it feels like nobody shows up and you know nobody comes or nobody's really paying attention. Um, they will pay attention if you reward them for participating or if you put, punish them for not participating and we have numbers in our office that you know kind of indicate how high or low that reward, reward has to be in order to get people to participate. Um, but my experience is they do work and I understand you know a lot of people feel like they just keep pushing this stuff, pushing this stuff, pushing this stuff at me and I really don't want to do it, but I always say too, I don't think that most people who are working want to be unwell. I mean, I think most people like achieve to be well and to live healthy lifestyles. Um, and I think um, more and more employees are appreciating um, employers who offer wellness programs. You know, I do get the, I just started this job and, you know, where I worked before, um, they had, um, they paid, they reimbursed my gym membership or they had exercise programs, they had people come on site and this place doesn't have it. What can I, what, what can I do? You know, and if you're a small employer, it's hard to put the resources into building and creating a wellness program. And that's where I go back to um, relying on, you know, Prevea 360, the health plans, the insurers, um, looking what they have available. Prevea 360 actually has a very strong, um, well-built program that's geared towards small employers, as do some of the other carriers. Um, but again, I understand the feeling of overload, but I also have a, a strong opinion that people themselves want to be well, and they do appreciate their employers' wellness programs. You know, I'll just, uh, a couple comments. I would just say, you know, keep it as simple as possible. Um, and then I would say integrate it with your plan design so there's some incentive and ownership on the employee to participate in those programs. So have some dollars at risk for the employees for that. Thank you.
And thank you again to the panel. Enjoy the discussion today. Just two quick reminders. Remember that August 16th and 17th, someplace better tour that Betsy spoke about earlier. And also remember next month, it's September 9th. It's the second Friday next month. So we'll see you here. Thank you.